Good afternoon and welcome to another Angry Bulletin here on The Angry Astronaut. And first of all, I'd like to start off by thanking everybody for deciding to join me to talk about Indian spaceflight as opposed to staying razor focused on the U.S. elections, which frankly, I'm going to do my best to ignore today and tomorrow until hopefully all of this is resolved and we can put it behind us and move on with whatever we Leader the United States ends up with. So now that all of that has been said, let's talk about India, because regardless of who the new president is, they're going to have to deal, hopefully, with NASA's current situation and the problems that NASA faces, especially when it comes to competing with the rest of the world. Because even though NASA still has a decided edge over most other space agencies in just about every regard, after all, NASA has multiple probes and other spacecraft operations throughout the solar system, rovers on Mars, vehicles orbiting in the Jovian systems, others on their way to Saturn, to Jupiter, etc. We have a lot that NASA is doing at the moment that really other nations are not. But still, there's a very clear distinction between what NASA has accomplished recently and agencies like ISRO, or the Indian Space Agency. Recently, India has set down a probe at the Lunar South Pole, a feat that nobody else has ever been able to accomplish. And more importantly, both of NASA's recent missions to the moon have not gone very well. One failed completely, and the other one, well, it set down but it's kind of difficult to call it a soft landing given the fact that the probe sort of crashed, ended up on its side, and some of its objectives were not accomplished because of this rough landing. And yet India, by way of contrast, has accomplished quite a lot on the moon and without the same number of mishaps, and they've done it on a much smaller budget. How is this possible? Is NASA really falling behind nations like India? And if so, how is India pulling this off? Is this a matter of NASA incompetence? Is that what's contributing to this difference at the moment? Or is India doing something that the United States simply cannot? I have to admit, watching this particular clip brought me a great deal of happiness because this is the sort of thing that folks in Cape Canaveral have been accustomed to seeing for decades now, but it's a relatively new thing for the people of India. Yes, they've been launching rockets for a while, but this is the LVM-3, the largest rocket to date that ISRO has been using, and it lights up the sky in in spectacular fashion, perhaps not as much as SLS might, but still really an amazing sight indeed, and quite an accomplishment for this nation. A nation that only achieved its independence a couple of generations ago, and a nation that has struggled with economic problems, poverty, starvation, and also a great deal of internal strife driven largely by religious conflict. But all of that having been said, India has accomplished things that I think have surprised the world, surprised everybody, perhaps, except for the Indians themselves. ISRO has proven to be an amazingly successful organization that has attracted clients from all over the planet, including prominent customers like OneWeb. And now ISRO is about to wade into the extremely difficult and dangerous field of human-rated spaceflight. Although the first human-rated mission has now been delayed until 2022, 
2026, and Israel made a statement about wanting to make sure to do it right and not to do it like Starliner. That was a bit of an embarrassing dig, but not an inaccurate one. And here's the most impressive distinction between ISRO and NASA. The recent allocation of funds that the Indian government gave to the Indian Space Agency was approximately $2.7 billion. That's roughly 10% of NASA's budget. And yet look at everything that they've been accomplishing. And to further put this into perspective, France has a space budget of over 3 billion euros. That's approximately $3.3 billion. And the European Space Agency, they have a budget of 7.79 billion euros or well over 8 billion dollars. And yet Europe has only recently started to talk about manned space flight and it's almost certainly not going to happen until the early 2030s. Once again, how is India pulling this off? Because what this money is going to be funding, this $2.7 billion, is their next phase of lunar exploration, an orbiter mission to Venus, the construction of the country's maiden space station, and the development of a reusable heavy lift rocket for satellite launches on top of their manned space program, which is known as the Gaganyan program, which isn't quite as ambitious as some of the things that the United States does. Only three astronauts to low Earth orbit in a relatively small capsule. It's about the same as what the Russians have been doing for decades, but still a huge accomplishment with that kind of funding. By the way, that's the most funding that India has ever received. But India's accomplishments with this budget have been nothing short of extraordinary. Did you know, for example, that India has done something that Elon Musk has not? They've been to Mars. As a matter of fact, they got there 10 years ago with the Maglayan mission, which, by the way, cost approximately $54 million, substantially less than the Hollywood motion picture Gravity. So let's put this into perspective. India went to Mars for less money than it cost Hollywood to make a movie about going to orbit. And then, of course, there was the Chandrayaan-3 moon mission. One of my most popular videos, by the way, that I put out, nearly a third of a million people checked into that particular video, a lot of them Indians. This mission required only $75 million worth of spending. That still is less money than was spent on the movie Gravity. And by way of comparison, NASA's Maven Mars Orbiter cost $582 million and even Russia's Luna 25, which crashed two days before Chandrayaan-3 successfully landed on the moon, that cost the Russians $133 million. And then both the astrobotic missions and the intuitive machine mission that went to the moon, neither of which was nearly as successful as Chandrayaan-3, both of those cost north of $100 million. India's economical achievements are rooted in a philosophy dating back to the 1960s. When Vikram Sabrahai, I think that's how it's pronounced, the visionary behind ISRO, convinced the government that a space program could serve the needs of a young, resource-strapped India. His vision laid the groundwork for a program that would do more with less, a principle that has fueled ISRO's growth ever since. They have a lean approach based on ingenuity. Retired civil servant Sisro Kumar Das, who managed ISRO's finances for over 20 years, traces ISRO's lean ethos back to its inception. Quote, in the 1960s, scientists worked with bicycles and bullet carts to transport rockets, he told the BBC. Sabrahai had to convince the government that a space program was not just a sophisticated luxury that had no place in a poor country like India. He explained that satellites could help India serve its citizens better. 
Now, DAS also attributes ISRO's low cost to its reliance on indigenously developed technology, a strategy that emerged after international sanctions following India's first nuclear test in 1974. By the way, this is another reason that India has such a close relationship with Russia, because the Soviet Union did not impose sanctions against India when all of this was happening in the 1970s and established a much closer relationship as far as military development development was concerned, whereas the West supported Pakistan. I leave all of you to decide whether or not that was a good strategy. Anyway, this embargo spurred Indian scientists to create homegrown technology, avoiding the high cost of imports. Quote, it was a blessing in disguise. Our scientists developed everything locally, which kept costs low and innovation high. Now, in addition to relying on domestic manufacturing, ISRO employs other cost-saving measures. For example, unlike NASA, which contracts private companies for satellite light manufacturing and takes out mission insurance, ISRO performs most operations in-house and skips insurance. Furthermore, ISRO avoids the costly practice of building engineering models for pre-launch tests, opting instead to fly with a single version, accepting the risks involved as part of the government-backed program. Does that sound kind of familiar? Yeah, it's kind of similar to how SpaceX develops things. Quote, ISRO's budget constraints often and force us to innovate, says Miliswami Anadurai, and I'm sure I mispronounced that, I apologize, who led India's Moon and Mars missions. Our teams are small, dedicated, and work extended hours without overtime because of their commitment, he said. Now that is something that almost certainly would not fly in Western nations. Working extended hours without overtime pay is against just about every labor law in the Western world, something that probably could not be duplicated over here. As a matter of fact, a lot of the low-cost wage advantages that India has would be impossible to duplicate in the West without duplicating India's economic situation for most of its citizens, something that a lot of Western people would not be very comfortable with, and I can't say that I blame them, but it definitely gives India a big advantage as far as labor costs are concerned. Anna Durai also explained how budget limitations drove them to adopt out-of-the-box solutions. For Chandrayaan-1, for example, additional payload weight was a common by reducing thrusters and pressure tanks, a decision that allowed the mission to proceed without exceeding its budget. And the Mangalayan mission was similarly cost-effective because it repurposed existing hardware from the Chandrayaan-2 mission. And then ISRO's efficiency has also delivered cost savings. Its small rockets necessitate creative solutions to reach distant destinations. Chandrayaan-3, for example, relied on Earth's gravity to slingshot it towards the moon, extending travel time but conserving fuel and resources. Russia's Luna 25, by contrast, used a powerful Soyuz rocket to achieve a quicker lunar journey. And by the way, the Intuitive Machines mission did the same same thing, utilizing a Falcon Heavy to drive it rapidly towards the moon for a quick rendezvous, as opposed to how Chandrayaan-3 did it. Quote, we used Mother Earth's gravity to nudge us towards the moon, says science writer Pallava Bagla. It took weeks of meticulous planning, but ISRO has mastered this technique. But India is not going to be able to use these techniques forever. A manned lunar mission by 2040, by the way, which is one of their biggest ambitions, that can't use these types of techniques in order to get human beings to the moon. Instead, you need big rockets and a direct trajectory, something that India hasn't really done yet and something that's definitely going to require more money. And India has approved work on what's called the next generation launch vehicle expected by 2032, which will carry much heavier payloads, but will definitely have higher costs. And with India opening the space sector to private companies, the program may soon face rising costs just like in the United States. But still, it seems that ISRO's legacy of ingenuity, forged in a culture of limited resources, has become a source of national pride, and I don't see that changing. 
and I foresee that Isro's philosophy is going to continue to give them a clear advantage, doing a lot more for a lot less in the years to come, even as they put human beings in orbit, followed by a space station, followed by their own astronauts on the moon. And incidentally, in my opinion, one other thing that's going to give India a clear advantage is their ongoing collaboration with both Russia and the United States at the same time. Indeed, it is the Russian space agency that's training India's astronauts for their first mission to orbit and not the United States. But at the same time, India has also recently signed the Artemis Accords, indicating that they are trying to get the most advantage from collaborations with both Russia and the United States, which I think is going to serve them quite well. I will continue to keep you up to date on the latest developments from ISRO and from spaceflight around the world. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and please consider supporting this channel on Patreon. I would really like to go to India and cover a launch, especially the Gaganyan program to send humans to orbit. Can't wait to bring you more details on spaceflight from around the world. So again, please check the description. And thanks again for watching. And as always, stay angry about space.